Uh, good evening. I'm Diane Kresh, uh, Director of Arlington Library, and we're going to go ahead and get started this evening. I'm thrilled and delighted to see so many of you here in August. We're, we're always told not to program in August because nobody's here. So, uh, so, so thank you for being here. Uh, as is always the case with these programs, it's, it's sponsored by the Friends of the Arlington Library. For those of you who are members, thank you. For those of you who would like to be members, we have forums available, but it's one of the many, many treasures the Friends of the Library bring us each year, all of this exciting programming. Uh, our guest's newly republished masterwork, Washington Journal, Reporting Watergate and Richard Nixon's Downfall, complete with a new afterword, is available for sale thanks to Jerry from Barnes & Noble, so there'll be copies available uh, later in the evening and we'll have a signing to, to wrap up. Tonight's program is also being recorded for broadcast on Arlington Television, so when we get to the questions portion, and Ms. Drew has assured me that she loves Q&A, so be sure to save all of those questions up, we ask that you do wait for the microphone so that everybody can have the benefit of your wisdom. Um, let's see. Like many of you, I, I got much of the context and meaning of Watergate directly from Elizabeth's coverage in the New Yorker magazine during those remarkable days of 1973 and 1974. In a blurb for Washington Journal, the book that grew out of that effort, writer Joan Didion called Drew's observations so coolly absorbing as to render the year almost reasonable. So we are thrilled to have Elizabeth Drew live and in person with us almost 40 years to the day that Richard Nixon helicoptered away from the presidency. So tonight we'll hear about the scandal that is still the standard against which all other political scandals are measured and which added the suffix gate to the vernacular. <laughs> but more importantly, it's a tale that serves as an object lesson. Many of us in this room were there and alive at the time and paying attention and caught up in those perilous events. But there were many who weren't, and this is a story that needs to be told and told again. But of course, Watergate was not just, was not one of the only uh, stories that Ms. Drew covered in her remarkable career since moving to this area after growing up in Ohio and attending Wellesley College in the late 50s. In addition to her time at The New Yorker, she's written for Congressional Quarterly and The Atlantic, appears frequently in the New York Review of Books, and contributes to Rolling Stone. She's, off, she's also active on Twitter, and that's in fact how we got in touch with her, where she's influencing a new generation of journalists. She was a television regular with her own PBS show and a Gronsky and Company, and in fact, over the weekend, I watched All the President's Men and saw a clip from one of those programs in the movie so she can add Hollywood extra to her resume. <laughs> Finally, she's been a presidential debate moderator and panelist and was even director of the Council on Foreign Relations. But tonight, she'll take us back to the high crimes, misdemeanors, and lessons of Watergate four decades after the Nixon presidency. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Drew. Thank you so much for turning out on this August night. Uh, I happen to like August in Washington. Uh, it's supposed to be, the theory is that it's calm and quiet and nothing going on. And we can just go about our business, nothing's terribly crowded. But 40 years ago we were uh, rudely interrupted, or we already had been. And I must say this last week wasn't the most peaceful week in the news. On top of which, we were uh, observing the 40th anniversary of President Nixon's resignation. Um, for those of you who were uh, going through it at the time and watching it, it still had to be a terribly confusing set of events. It was hard enough to keep up with them and make sense of them at the time. And so I got a dream assignment. I was uh, fairly new at the New Yorker, and I was in on Labor Day of 73, 
and the justly legendary William Sean, the editor said to me, well, what are you thinking of writing about next? And I said, you know, I just have a sense that we're going to change vice presidents, Spiro Agnew, whom you may have forgotten, <laughs> uh, wasn't yet indicted, but he'd been charged with, he was sitting there in the executive office building in the vice president's office taking envelopes of cash uh, from um, Maryland contractors whom he had helped out when he was governor. This was a bit much even for Richard Nixon. He thought that was very uncool. <laughs> so he was going to have to go. And I said, I also think we're going to change presidents. Now, this was a very far out thought at the time. But um, I've, until that woman from Delaware ran a few years ago, you st stole my line. <laughs> I used to say, it's not that I'm such a good reporter. I'm a witch. And I smell things. I sense things. <laughs> and I sensed it. And so Mr. Sean, in his wondrous way, said, he always landed on some interesting aspect. He said, well, about the vice president, even if it's just that, we don't know how to do that. We've never done it before. How do you change vice presidents? How do you pick a new one? How do you put them in office? That was how his mind worked. And so we agreed that I would write in journal form, not a diary. I would follow the events. And I would go to uh, press conferences. I would have interviews. I had many interviews in the course of this book of the series, and I would comment on what was going on and my reactions to them. I did a lot of interviewing. I did a lot of running around. It was 40 years ago. And I, when I came back from talking to him, I talked to my great mentor, Mr. John Gardner, if many of you may remember him. Oh, a great man. He'd been secretary of then Health, Education, Welfare. He founded Common Cause. He was a remarkable person and a great influence on my life. And we had lunch, and he said, Elizabeth, it took about 20 minutes to say my name, and he said, write it so that 40 years from now, he said 40 years, people will say, oh, that's what it was like. So as you know, uh, going through it, it was confusing, but we have generations of people who were too young or weren't even born yet. And this is such an important story in our history that I, I'm passionate about the fact that people really need to understand it, what it was, what it wasn't, and what it was like during that period. And that is what I did in the series. And I have to say, uh, as I reread uh, the galleys, but I had to reset the uh, series for this book, I was astonished. I was shrieking all over again. Oh my God, did they really do that? You know. <laughs> and you could also see, since I was writing at the moment, and I didn't go back and change anything, uh, you could see, you could put things together that you couldn't at the time, uh, when monstrous lies were being told, and it was it was really kind of an astonishing amazing experience. I feel quite privileged to have been given this front row seat and this incredible out outlet for writing about it. And then Random House came along and said, well, we'd like to publish this as a book. I hadn't thought of that. And then, uh, it, frankly, it's out now because it was out of print. And I wasn't thinking anniversary. And I wasn't thinking being on the circuit about it. I just wanted it to live. And I wanted it available for people who wanted to understand and might be quite fascinated with what happened. What was it like then? It was kind of like your reaction. It was funny, uh, hilarious, frightening. We were scared. We didn't know what was going to happen and what this strange man in the White House was going to do next because he'd done so many totally unpredictable things, seemingly irrational things. We didn't know at the time, but I learned later, he was drunk a lot. And he also uh, took a medication given to him by an investor, uh, Jack Dreyfus, who was one of his supporters. And Jack Dreyfus, they were talking one night about being depressed. And uh, 
Dreyfus said, well, I've got this great medication. It's called Dilantin. And it really helped me get past my mother's death. And Nixon was still going on about his mother's death, which was strange because she was a very cold woman and never really praised him. But anyway, uh, and he called her a saint and did all sorts of things. Uh, Dilantin has never been uh, approved as an antidepressant, as an anticonvulsive drug. The effect of it is to enhance the characteristics of being drunk. Now, don't worry about it. We just had a drunk president. Uh, and there are times when you could, when the record shows and enough people said enough things, like on the eve of the Cambodia invasion, um, probably when he called at least one of two worldwide nuclear alerts. I mean, this was terrifying. Uh, we didn't know he was drunk, but we knew all these strange and seemingly irrational things had happened. We would, uh, we would laugh, but it was kind of a nervous sort of hysteria. Uh, we would joke about, well, I wonder if this conversation's being tapped. We didn't know. It was possible that it was. Uh, I have a friend whose husband had, was a journalist and he was being tapped in her very intimate conversations. She was a very close friend of Ted Kennedy's then wife. The White House was hearing all this. Um, there, were, there were no boundaries. So how did this happen? Who was Richard Nixon and how did this happen? I'm, losing, I'm not gonna keep track of the time so when you're bored with me, just start throwing things or something. Uh, so many, there's been a lot of, when did Watergate start? Did it start with this, did it start with that? I think it started when Nixon was born. Uh, <laughs> there was something in him that was so off and he grew up uh, resentful, getting even with people whom he thought were his enemies. He was a loner as a kid. He liked to read. And in you know, Whittier, California, this wasn't terribly popular. Uh, he wasn't athletic, but in his way, he was always trying to prove, show him, I'm gonna show him. So he went out for football. He was terrible, he's like fourth string. but. He was always trying to show them and get even, and he took all this into the White House. By this time, it was a highly developed sense of he had a large group of enemies. He did confuse opponents with enemies. Therefore, uh, a political opponent was an enemy. Anybody who criticized him was an enemy. Newspaper people, university presidents, foundation presidents, some business people, they were enemies. They did draw up an enemies list. Now we're kind of used to that idea, but you have to back off and think about it. Just start afresh. A president telling his aides to draw up an enemies list and then willing to use the instruments of government against them. Whether it was the IRS, no, it has nothing to do with the allegations of what's been going on recently. If you want to ask me about that later, I'll be glad to, and I'll get a lot of nasty tweets, but that's okay. Um, they're sort of organized tweets that come along every once in a while when they catch me not following their doctrine. Uh, I, I'm, I'm alive still, checking a week. Um, here's the other thing. The White House hired a goon squad. Now, some of it was done indirectly through the committee to reelect the president, otherwise known as creep. Uh, some of it was done through, they did it through the Treasury Department, but federal funds, White House money, uh, appropriations, were going to this group of people who were to carry out Nixon's fantasies about his enemies. They were thugs. Uh, an ex-cop from New York named Anthony Ulazowitz. He was kind of my favorite. He was very funny. Before the uh, Irvin Committee about talking about, you know, mail drops and the, the, the one thing, uh, the saving grace of these people is they were stumble bums. They messed up everything they did. <laughs> Thus, they were caught in the Watergate. Now, people don't realize this, and I realized it in the course of my research, this, the time they were caught in the Watergate was the fourth t attempt 
to get into the DNC and put some bugs on some telephones and photograph some documents. Now think about that. I, it doesn't, people say, did Nixon know about it? It doesn't matter whether he knew about it. It happened under his aegis. His aides were carrying out what they thought he wanted done. Uh, I find in the tapes no reference to say, what a terrible, stupid thing to do. I mean, what were they doing there? He was a little annoyed that they put the tape on the door and got caught. <laughs> but they kept doing this. Now, what Nixon was really worried about when the uh, burglars were caught was what had already happened. And think about this. These uh, goons had raided the office of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist. Daniel Ellsberg, as all of you know, had leaked the Pentagon Papers, and he was really, Henry Kissinger was hysterical about this. I don't know why. It, they'd been drawn up under his aegis. Uh, but they were afraid that it would uh, diminish support for the Vietnam War, even though the Pentagon Papers were really about uh, uh, what happened under Lyndon Johnson and some of the misleading things that they had saw, done and said and so on. So anything went with getting, Nixon would tell you, get the goods on them. We're going to destroy them. President of the United States talking this way. And so um, Dr. Fielding, Dr. Lewis Fielding in Los Angeles, uh, these guys cased his office and then they went in, they broke in, and they were to get Ellsberg's psychiatrist files on him. Imagine. Um, this was the most serious, and it came up in the Irvin hearings, and Herman Talmadge of, of Georgia, with no great liberal, said, whatever happened, the idea that a man's home is his castle. And I think it was John Ehrlichman who said, well, that's been substantially eroded over the years, sir. <laughs> That was the mentality. Now, as it happened, there were no files. Some casing job they did. Uh, it was the same thing when the President of the United States said to his aides, and this is caught on tape, uh, go into the Brookings Institution. They thought that two aides, two, peop two former Kissinger aides who had worked on the Pentagon Papers had a couple of chapters that had not been released and they desperately wanted to get hold of those. So uh, Nixon said, get in there, start up, firebomb it, firebomb it, uh, blow up the safe, and get those goddamn papers. <laughs> well, um, I think it was Mr. my friend Mr. <coughs> Mr. Ulazovitz had cased the place. And so it was about to happen. This is one of the few things that we know of that Nixon's staff, somebody on the staff, stopped. It was gonna be very elaborate. They were gonna bring in and make up a fire engine and bring it in, and in the confusion, they were gonna get into the, there was just one problem. There were no files. There was no safe. There were no papers. So in their, I stay away from the psychobabble, but in their feverish imagination, uh, they assumed that there was this. But when the burglars were caught, on June 17th, Nixon was in Key Biscayne. He, he stayed away from the White House, even as recent presidents. He stayed away a lot. He didn't like it there. And, but he had almost no friends. It was a strange figure to be in politics. He didn't particularly like people. People didn't particularly like him. He was almost without friends. I mean, when people run, you've got to look at these things now. We've learned a lot about what to look for. Look for what kind of people they have around him. Nixon had thugs around him. And so usually everything went ahead, but sometimes he would, in his drunken state, sometimes he would make calls like at three in the morning. And he'd call an aide and say, I want the whole seventh floor of the State Department fired in the morning, click. And then he'd call back and say, this is the president, that order is not appealable, slam. And it was left to the judgment, judgment of Ehrlichman and Haldeman and Colson to decide whether these things, and John Dean, whether these were a good idea or whether to ignore them at their peril. 
um, on the eve of the Cambodian invasion, he and B.B. Rebozo were at Camp David, quite drunk. And it's not clear, they weren't clear whose voice it was, calling up Kissinger and saying, you better get this right, Henry, it's your ass. Um, and they were very, very um, uh, ready, all ready to go. Nixon kept having his staff watch Patton. <laughs> because, you doubt that? <laughs> he did. He watched it several times and he made sure his staff watched it. He also, uh, his first memoir that he wrote after he lost the 1960 race very closely to John Kennedy, he and Kennedy were kind of friendly on the Senate floor and Kennedy kindly said to him, why don't you write a memoir? Nixon's idea of a memoir was called Six Crises. And it was about six situations where he was in big trouble and very challenged, but he prevailed. That's his view of his life. One of the chapters was on how he helped expose Alger Hiss. It took a while, but he helped expose him, and it did turn out that he had been in the State Department spying for the Soviet Union. There was a ring of people doing that at the time. So Nixon told an aide to have the plumbers, most of them were Cubans, who had felt very betrayed, understandably, by the Bay of Pigs when Kennedy denied them air cover, and it was a disaster. So Nixon wanted the Cubans to understand that they were all in this together fighting the commies. And he was fighting the commies, and they were fighting the commies, so he got them very worked up. In any event, when the burglars were caught, and Nixon came back three days later. And it's quite clear from his conversations, mainly with Haldeman, that he was far more worried about the Ellsberg psychiatrist's office being raid being found out than the Watergate break-in. I heard some ostensible experts talking recently on a panel saying, well, if he just admitted to a problem with the uh, Watergate break-in, would he have been all right? And they were saying, yeah, he might, no, no, he was already in very deep trouble. And, and he was very vulnerable, and he knew it. That's why they did the cover-up. It was really about the Ellsberg, about Dr. Fielding's, the break-in into his office. And so the cover-up began that night and in conversations with Haldeman the next day. This is where the 18 and a half minutes went missing because I guess it's bad enough what got printed, what wasn't uh, erased, but it's quite clear that they went deeply into the details of how to pull off the cover-up. But even in the parts that weren't erased, they were talking about paying off the burglars uh, who were gonna have to go before court, but paying them off so that they wouldn't admit to anything. They know a lot. They did all those other things, Haldeman said. So that's where it began, and that's why it began. So where does the Watergate break-in really fit in all this? Uh, chronologically, it was crucial because it provided the first break uh, into the case of something very peculiar going on. And of course, you know, one of them had in his notebook W.H. White House and the phone number of his contact. They weren't real clever. <laughs> but that opened up the whole thing. So chronologically, and the work that um, Bob and Carl did was, was terribly important in following this out and where did the money come from. Common Cause was in it. Uh, the uh, FBI, the prosecutors were in it. The FBI was examining it. And that is why on June 23rd, uh, this turned out to be Nixon's doom, sort of unfortunately, but I'll get to that if I don't remind me and ask me. Uh, where he tells an aide to call the CIA, to call the FBI, to call him off on the investigation, telling him it's a matter of national security. You stay out of it. Well, that was such clear-cut obstruction of justice. And it was discovered after the House Committee had voted three articles of impeachment. He was going to be impeached. But uh, a lot of people, especially Republicans, really didn't want to take that vote, and in the Senate, they really didn't want to go through a trial. 
Uh, I hate to bring up such mundane points, but 1974 was a midterm election coming up in November, and the Republicans really were getting, first they weren't sure what was, was something really wrong, and I talked to a number of them all through the book, and you see where their minds start to change, and they start to get very worried about Nixon and what it was that caused them to do that, to the point where at the end they were panicked. They just wanted to get him out of there as soon as possible because he was really mucking things up for them, and they didn't want to do a trial. Nixon still had a base of about 30 to 33 percent, and they were very vocal. He also had this Rabbi Korf who was going around defending him, and Billy Graham and a few others. Um, so that's where the cover-up began. So in the sequence of things, the break-in was not, the Watergate break-in was not as big a deal as some of the other things that they did. It was the pattern, uh, and as they said, the impeachment inquiry and the impeachment articles, a pattern in practice of activities for which they voted articles of impeachment. Now, I want to take a minute to talk to you about that impeachment process. I'm highly disturbed at the way the term is being thrown around now, as if it's just another political trick, another political thing to do. And of course, Newt Gingrich ruined the solemnity, the awesomeness of impeachment uh, when he quite recklessly went after impeaching uh, Bill Clinton on the Monica Lewinsky matter. He said it was a matter that he lied under oath. No, I mean, that was the cover, but they wanted to get him out, and they were thought America would be so shocked by uh, Clinton's recklessness, frankly, that uh, they were going to get him and get him uh, out. They went through. He was impeached in the House, and there was a Senate trial, and the Senate voted not to convict but back to the Watergate impeachment. This was the model, and I hope if you have the book, you'll read that, I hope you read it all, but I'll, you read that part of it, which was, <clears throat> it was amazing, a uh, series of events. You had this House Judiciary Committee, most of them pretty undistinguished members of Congress. The new chairman, Peter Rodino, uh, from New Jersey, had just taken it over. His predecessor had been defeated. And he was considered a sort of, you know, mediocrity. And of course, the minute Peter Rodino from New Jersey is named, the rumors start that he's probably mobbed up, which he was not. And this ordinary man rose to greatness. So did other members of the committee. Now, what they did was they, uh, there were three people who were very in instrumental in how this went. And they were very smart. Um, they picked a, a council, there had been a council of the committee who'd been very partisan and very with the lefty liberals on the committee who wanted to, you know, impeach Nixon for all sorts of things, and, uh, Cambodia and other matters. And they said, this can't be, it cannot have any appearance of partisanship. So there you have it. I mean, just even there, it's different from anything that's going on now or that happened under Clinton. They said it had to come from the center of the committee and it had to be bipartisan. Therefore, both wings were isolated. The way on the right, the diehard die hard Nixon supporters and the lefties who wanted to go much further. Uh, they picked as a counsel John Doerr, who's one of our heroes. He had been in the Eisenhower Justice Department, but also in the Robert Kennedy Justice Department uh, as a civil rights uh, official. And so he was without question a man of in great integrity. And he was no showboat. He didn't need to be heard or seen. He, he just carefully, carefully did his work. And then there was a 27-year-old miracle named Francis O'Brien. He lied about his age at the time. He told me he was 34, but I, I, I got it out of him. He was really 27. And the three of them uh, got this, you know, had these principles that it had to be bipartisan. It had to come from the center. I sat there just about every day for quite a while. They were having extremely serious discussions of 
what did the founders mean by impeachment? What did high crimes and misdemeanors mean? We were into the Federalist Papers and what James Madison said. And this was very serious. And they took their time and it was high-minded. And they felt that this was the only way if Nixon should be impeached, and they didn't go in with the assumption that he should be, they had to see if there were grounds for it. It was the only way the country would accept it. And so they voted, finally they voted three articles of impeachment. One was about uh, obstruction of justice, but in terms of not cooperating with the committee, not turning over tapes, not turning over documents. The main one was Article Two, which was abuse of power. And it was about a pattern in practice. It didn't say that you had to prove that Nixon knew about this when. I hate to disillusion you, but Howard Baker's famous question was really meant to so narrow the question that it would be very hard to uh, prosecute or impeach Nixon. You had to prove what did the president know and when did he know it. No, you didn't. What happened under his aegis? What kind of place was it? Uh, what kind of people did he pick? Why did these things happen? Is there any sign that he objected to any of it? No. So there was a little parallel in a certain eastern state, perhaps, but we'll leave that for now. Um, it was, he was held accountable for the actions of his people. It was a terribly important principle. Now again, it, it doesn't have much connection, or really much at all, with what's going on now. And here come the twe tweets. But <laughs> this was a major historical event. Now it was very wild. I've told you it was very wild during this period. And I want to just read to you a, a couple of things. Going through it, it was so confusing. Um, you know, we had, thank heavens, there was no cable then. There was no Twitter then. We would have gone mad because any rumor would have been out there. And you couldn't think. Uh, the com competition to, you know, scoop would have been ferocious and frankly quite careless, so I'm very glad. Uh, it seems sort of very peaceful compared to now. But we had the morning papers, we had the radio, we had n evening papers, there were evening papers then, and we had the evening news, that was it. And we had the telephone. And so there was a lot of calling around. Have you heard, my God, have you heard? They, you know, this just happened and this just broke, or you'd go to Capitol Hill and People were, my, you know, there was a lot of my godding going on because things just kept happening. Did you hear that two tapes are missing? Oh my God, uh, 18 and a half minutes have been erased. By the way, it's pretty clear Nixon did the erasing at Camp David. He tried to pin it on his uh, secretary, Rosemary Woods, but when she tried to enact what she said happened, she couldn't do it, she couldn't reach the phone and put her foot on the pedal. Um, Ehrlichman said Nixon did it and I can imagine him being at Camp David and maybe erased more than he meant to, but I'm pretty sure that's what happened. I keep reminding, this is the President of the United States. And I think, you know, we respected the presidency more then than now, and I think this might have been the breaking point when you realize that this person had done these things, had been lying to the public on a serial basis, Something, some of the majesty went out of the presidency as of then. Now, probably the wildest night of all, it was a terrifying night, it was the Saturday night, it's called the Saturday Night Massacre, but I don't use those cliches. Um, until then, there was just about no talk of impeachment. Father Drynan had introduced some resolutions of impeachment, but uh, it was considered such an awesome thing to do remove a president from office. There had been one precedent which was right after the Civil War and it failed against Andrew Johnson, it failed in the Senate. So this was a, a frightening thing to do, to remove a president. Uh, it was taken very seriously and until this Saturday night, it wasn't much in the air. But what happened 
was that uh, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously that the president had to turn over the tapes to Archibald Cox, the independent counsel, special prosecutor, who had been appointed by an act passed by the Congress that there had to be one. And Cox wanted the tapes, he'd subpoenaed them, and Nixon said, no, I'm not gonna give them to you. And the Supreme Court ruled unanimously that he should turn them over. He was not gonna obey the Supreme Court. So it was building up, and it was a Saturday, and I said it was a beautiful Saturday day. It was unfair, you know, to ruin our Saturday this way. But the rumors were, was he going to fire Archibald Cox? I was on a, well, I was on a Gronsky and Company at the time, so we were live while these bulletins were coming in uh, from the AP and so on. And so uh, as evening news broadcasts go on the air at 6.30, there's still only rumor and speculation. Nothing has actually happened since Cox's press conference that afternoon. Archie Cox had been a very stiff and stern uh, law professor at Harvard. I, had a boyfriend at Harvard Law School, and I sometimes went to the classes, and he was terrifying. But this Archie, he was Jimmy Stewart, he was all shucks, and I don't wanna to be too big for my britches, and this kind of talk, it was devastating. And he was just explaining why he thought the president should turn over the tapes. And so the issue was, was the president gonna fire him? Which would have gone against the laws of Congress and, and the law. 648 Washington, UPI, not knowledgeable sources close to the White House said Saturday night that N President Nixon would fire the special prosecutor, Archibald Cox, for, quote, blatant and open defiance of the president. 653 Bulletin, Washington, UPI, President Nixon's compromise over release of the Watergate tapes blew up Saturday night with reports that Attorney General Elliot Richardson might be resigning. They had got this bright idea to, rather than turn over the tapes, uh, they would present them to Senator John Stennis, a very conservative Democratic senator from Mississippi, whom they took to calling Judge Stennis. He'd been a circuit, minor circuit judge in Mississippi, and he was notoriously hard of hearing. But he, he was supposed to listen to the tapes and verify that the White House summaries, <laughs> honest, honest, and Howard Baker and Sam Irvin bought into this plan. It was amazing. Uh, so, uh, 656, AP, Washington, Attorney General Elliot Richardson appears ready to resign. This is the wake of the president's order barring further court action to get the Watergate tapes. Deputy Attorney General William Ruckelshaus gave the impression he talked with newsmen and blah, blah, blah. He, would, he would resign. So, two attorney generals were, in effect, fired that night within about an hour. Um, a third one, Robert Bork, uh, came, yes, Robert, that Robert Bork, came along and said, okay, I'll do it. And uh, he fired Cox and became Attorney General. The FBI, there were reports the FBI was moving in on the special prosecutor's offices, surrounding him. Uh, it was terrifying. Bulletin 831. UPI, President Nixon accepted Attorney General Elliot Richardson's resignation Saturday and fired Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox. 8.31, Nelson Benton of CBS was on the White House lawn, breathless and seeming shaken. We were, we were all shaken. This was a White House and a president out of control. We didn't know it. He delivers a report in much the same manner that war correspondents did from the battlefields in Vietnam. The president ordered a Cox be fired. Richardson refused to fire Cox, has resigned. Ruckel's house, Richardson's deputy, refused to fire Cox and was fired. Robert Bork, formerly Solicitor General, has fired Cox and is now the acting Attorney General. Office of Special Prosecutor has been abolished. Uh, I said, at this time in this verbose city, nobody seems to know what to say. We were stunned. Um, the news is coming too fast, faster and harder than anyone expected. It's almost impossible to absorb. Summary firings are not our style. Something about Saturday night, a private time, the dark, too much disarrangement at once. The speed of the events become part of their substance. One journalist says it's like being in a banana republic. And we felt that way. Another ordinary and outspoken defender of the administration said it's like downtown Santiago. 
Chile had had some problems at the time. Their statements bespeak anxieties that are beyond matters of atmospherics. An enigmatic president has summarily fired three people, uh, men who had built some public trust. What seemed logical and even inexorable this afternoon has taken on unpredictable and disturbing proportions. There's no way of telling what the president was thinking. Did he consider the impact these events we have? Could he know? Did he care? There's another question people are asking. It's whether the president had acted in an irrational burst of temper. It is clear the president will go to some lengths to assert his independence of the courts and of prosecution. Will he succeed in this? Is there to be any check on him on, or any president ever again? Do we have a system of laws? I mean, it went that deep and it was that alarming. I always felt during it, while people were talking about this is a criminal conspiracy and crimes and so on, I felt that we were in the middle of, we were, a constitutional crisis. And there it was, right there. Is the president accountable to the courts, to the Congress, to anyone? Uh, can he just do what he wants at will? Uh, did we have a system of laws? We didn't know then. We lost our moorings. Uh, and then at the end of the chapter, just to show you how things kept banging at us, it is announced on the radio that Saudi Arabia has cut off its oil supplies, the United States. Can't think about that now. So um, there's one other I would like to read you because it was so wonderfully Nixonian. He was such fun. He really was a lot of fun. <laughs> When he wasn't terrifying us, he, you know, I, he's the most fascinating figure of my entire political life, career. And I started as a little girl watching this strange man. He was running for vice president, uh, and he was on television, and he was talking about his daughter's dog named Checkers, and I thought, well, this is strange. And little did I know that I would live half of my life with him. They were always thinking, he was always thinking, he could just cauterize the thing. He'd fire some people, that would take care of it. He would do this or that, and that would take He'd release the, release the uh, transcripts of the tapes, which really, um, that was very, very serious. These uh, not exactly delicate members of Congress were appalled and shocked at the degree of Nixon's uh, swearing, his prejudices, the way he talked about Jews, they're all psychiatrists, Bob, he said. Um, the Jews all hate me about blacks. They're just monkeys down from the trees. Um, it was, they thought maybe he wasn't the most uh, charming and smooth person they'd ever seen, but this was appalling. I mean, the language was just amazing. And Nixon, you, this was a voice-activated taping system. He said, oh, Johnson and Kennedy did it too. They didn't have anything remotely this, uh, a, this pervasive. Now, of course, it was his doom, and he knew they were on. And one time John Dean talked about it. He went over in a corner to try to whisper it to him because he knew that the tapes were running. So what was going through his head, I don't know. I think he just kept thinking, you know, I will survive this. It won't be a problem. So at 7 p.m. on this uh, night, November 17th, I said there's no choice but to watch the president being questioned by newspaper editors meeting at Disney World in Orlando. Very appropriate setting. <laughs> and this was to be, they always had names for things. This was to be Operation Candor. <laughs> the week to turn it around. So he was gonna do that with his speech. And um, he said, I'm gonna disclose some things. Now, John Mitchell, at the time of the break-in at the Watergate, John Mitchell was already, uh, he'd been his attorney general, I'll think about that, this man had been attorney general in the United States, but he was now the head of CREEP, Committee to Reelect the President. So John Mitchell knew all about the uh, burglars, the plumbers. You know, they had an office in the executive office building saying, plumbers. Uh, I don't know what people thought. The idea was <laughs> they were going to plumb for leaks, in other words, Ellsberg's leak of the Pentagon Papers. Of course, it went well, way, way beyond that. And this very, seemed to me, very nice man, Eagle Bud Krogh, I talked to him, uh, was in charge. 
this is what could happen. I think he, Kroger was a very decent guy, but you get caught up in this madness and this uh, boundaryless set of uh, events that are going on, Bud Krogh ended up in jail. And um, some of them more, had it more coming than he did, but he was in the wrong place at the wrong time and he was too loyal. Uh, so tonight, the telephone, the president discloses that he phoned John Mitchell on June 20th, that's when he came back from uh, Key Biscayne, he was meeting with Haldeman and others, and here's what he said he was doing. He said, I telephoned John Mitchell in order to cheer him up after the men were caught in the Watergate. <laughs> he goes on into detail about why a tape ran out, the 18 and a half minutes, and we are further and further from the point. This was quite lovely. He explains that his taping system was a little Sony. He was going to a little Sony, and a little Sony that they had. And what they had is these little lapel mics on, on my desk. And then he rubbed the flag pin in his lapel. They really started this flag pin business to show that you know they were patriotic. My mentor, Mr. Gardner, said at the time, we should all wear the flag pins. Don't let them take it from us. We should all put the decals on our car. Don't let them own it. But he was wiser than most people. So he explains at the same time, little Sony that they had, and he's rubbing the little flag pin, like it was this little Sony thing. And he said, the, the equipment Johnson had was incidentally much better equipment. No, it wasn't. There have been reports of presidents, Kennedy and Johnson had some telephone conversations. Uh, an editor asked him his reaction to the discovery of tapes of conversations with Dean and Mitchell did not exist. And the president replies with great disappointment to him because I want the evidence out. He kept saying that. He said of the plumbers were established to stop leaks of information that were endangering the national security, including one so serious that even Senator Irvin and Senator Baker agreed it should not be disclosed. By then, they would pretty much blotted their copybooks as independent, ferocious investigators. Asked how Watergate could happen, the president replies, 72. Now, this was all about a lot of it was about 1972 to make sure he was reelected, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, arguing that fuel uh, prices were high and he had tried to hold down the cost of the trip, he said a backup plane had been sent this time. Usually there's a backup plane to Air Force One. He said, and if his own plane goes down, quote, it goes down and they don't have to impeach. Uh, he talked about uh, well, there was a question of his vice presidential papers and what size deduction he took for the contribution, and that was a big thing. And B.B. Rebozo, and he did have one other friend, Robert Applin, out the amount of money they'd given him to uh, have his two homes, one in San Clemente and one in Key Biscayne. Now, you're, standing, you're sitting there watching. This is your president. He said, let me just say this. I want to say this to the television audience. I made my mistakes. I can't do the, I can do the jowls and all that, but I don't think it'd be pretty. <laughs> Let me just say this. I want to say this to the television audience. I made my mistakes, but in all of my years of public life, I have never profited, never profited from public service. I have earned every cent, and in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. He said he welcomed this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. <laughs> then he says, well, I am not a crook. Can you imagine <laughs> the president? Well, I could go on. There are some really quite wonderful scenes at the Grand Ole Opry. I will. Um, I just want to add one thing. The best is yet to come. After uh, when I was about to, uh, when I knew I was going to republish this book, I added a 10,000 word afterward about what happened after Nixon went off to San Clemente. He sort of, you know, seemed to disappear. What happened was being Nixon, being the guy, and I have a certain respect, if not awe, for this, how low can you be when you've been thrown out of the office that you had fought so hard for? And he, so they drew up another plan called Operation Wizard. Wizard was a plan to resurrect him, 
to get to have him be a respected figure again. And there are wonderful stories how he blackmailed Bill Clinton to having him in to meet him uh, before Clinton had his first summit meeting with a Soviet leader. Uh, he blackmailed Clinton by letting it be known that if Clinton didn't have him in there, he would write an op-ed. By this time, Nixon was pretty getting pretty established, and he had a lot of outlets, the New York Times, Newsweek, Time, he, could, he wrote. And he said he would, he threatened that he would write an article uh, completely demolishing Clinton's foreign conduct of foreign policy. He's the same old guy. You know, he never really changed. He got the Chinese to uh, get him invited to the first date dinner with a Chinese leader that Jimmy Carter had. Now, who's the last person Jimmy Carter would want at this dinner? <laughs> so and Nixon tried and tried, and he couldn't get an invitation, but he got the Chinese, his friends, because he'd gone back there even after he left office, and uh, they got him invited. Now, I have to tell you one more story, and that is when Nixon got tired of San Clemente, he was moving along on uh, Project Wizard. Um, he was doing a lot of speaking. He took foreign trips. He would make speeches, and he would talk about foreign leaders I have known, and um, people were impressed. He was a smart man, I mean, and he did accomplish some very important things in foreign policy, he picked foreign policy, because who wants to hear somebody talk about uh, education? You know, he knew that if you wanted to be a guru in this country, if you wanted to be a Henry Kissinger, whom he was so jealous of, but you know, they had a very complicated relationship that's actually quite funny. Um, you were a foreign policy guru. And so he said he wanted to go where the action is. He moved to New York. He, they brought, bought a brownstone. Some co-ops wouldn't let him in. And they said they worried about the uh, up, uh, uproar that would be caused by the Secret Service around. Yeah, that's what they said. Anyway, so he bought a brownstone. It was decorated in Chinese decor. And Nixon decided he would have a series of dinners mostly stag, almost all of them stag dinner, of movers and shakers of New York, bankers, council on foreign relations, publishers, uh, business people. And he had them regularly. And here's how it went. At 7 o'clock on the dot, people would come and he'd meet them in the vestibule. Now, Nixon was never good at small talk. Uh, but somehow, he would get through this. And they'd go upstairs. He loved to make very dry martinis. And so he'd make the martinis, and these people would be served excellent Chinese hors d'oeuvres. And then they went down to dinner, and then he would have a discussion topic, and they were served excellent Chinese food by Chinese waiters. And subtle he was not. And then they would go back upstairs, and there'd be a conversation. At 10.30 on the dot, uh, he would look at the clock, and pick out the most prominent person there. And he would say, well, it's 10.30, and I promised to get Peter Calkin to the uh, House of Prostitution by 11 o'clock, so I guess we have to break up now. <laughs> he was a laugh riot. <laughs> but it worked. It became the hot ticket. Everybody wanted to go to his dinners. And Nixon had a funeral that he'd have died all over again to have. <laughs> five presidents, the existing one and four previous presidents. Now, nobody had had that. So in the end, in his way, he won. He succeeded in his goal. Now, do people go around admiring him now? No. Uh, some do. There are some diehards. I'll be hearing from them. Um, <laughs> but in his own terms, he did succeed. And it's kind of, I think it's kind of a, there are a lot of stories I haven't told you about that. It, it's kind of a wonderful story. And it's my man Nixon. He used to say, you're not, defe you're, not, you're not defeated when you're beaten. You're defeated when you, a man is not defeated when he's be beaten. He's defeated when he quits. And I am not a quitter. You've seen his resignation statement over and over on the television all week. I have never been a quitter. And he wasn't. And there's something rather admirable about his 
his uh, endurability, his durability. Um, he would have just adored his funeral. I think it's a good idea. Yeah. A, re a really basic question, um, what, what do you think uh, Nixon's pardon, what effect did that have on American political culture? That's an excellent question. The question was what effect do I think that Nixon's pardon had on American culture? A very profound one. Uh, as you know, a little while after Ford became president, he pardoned Nixon. This was a wildly controversial decision a lot of people were extremely upset about it. I thought it was the right thing to do. I thought he had been seriously punished. I mean, how much worse can it be than you're thrown out of the presidency that you've strived for for decades and decades? Uh, Ford, it really would have been an enormous distraction. Ford said four years of Watergate was enough. I rather agreed with him. I mean, I could have gone on, it was fascinating. <laughs> but the man, somebody said the other day that the pardon was really for Ford himself, that he needed to be able to go on and govern. So there's always been a lurking suspicion that there was a deal. Uh, Ford had to go up and testify on the Hill. Uh, there's no evidence of that. But I think, I just thought it made a lot of sense. Now I know a serious uh, jurist who thinks they should have gone through the process so that it was absolutely clear that Nixon was guilty as charged. Um, he actually was named an unindicted co-conspirator by a grand jury, and scads of his aides went to jail. Uh, so there's not, if you have an open mind at all, there's no, not much question that this serious things had gone on of which he was culpable and for which he was responsible. But there's been a lot of sort of suspicions since then. Uh, well, a deal and it sort of soured a lot of people. But uh, that had to do with, this was a very emotional time for the country. And I do think that Ford did do the right thing. There was also questions whether you can try a president, even if he's an ex-president. So uh, there, was, there was a legal issue about that. But in terms of the peace and quiet of the country and getting on, we, we had real issues to deal with. I think it was the right thing. You mentioned Henry Kissinger several times. Uh, did he have any direct role in uh, Nixon's skullduggery uh, domestically, or did he uh, merely encourage Nixon to do the wrong thing uh, and spent most of his time killing people overseas? Uh, you hear the question? You want me to repeat them? What'd they say? Okay. You do have a good voice. Uh, there's no evidence that Kissinger was involved in what we call the Watergate. Some call it capers. They weren't capers. They were far more serious than that. He did, because he was rather hysterical about the leak of the Pentagon Papers, he certainly encouraged Nixon to uh, get Ellsberg and get those papers out of Brookings that weren't there. Uh, he turned over the names of some of his own staff members to the FBI to be wiretapped. A uh, lot of people, K Kissinger had a way of befriending or you might say seducing journalists, never me. Uh, he used to say, because I was having a weekly television program, and he'd say to me, I'll not be on your program, you terrify me. <laughs> Which was his idea of a joke, but I think he thought maybe I was sort of onto him a little bit. I wasn't buying this uh, secret swinger stuff that he was doing. He was, uh, you know, going around being, uh, he was a bachelor. And he said, uh, power is the greatest aphrodisiac. He was absolutely right, this dumpy uh, professor uh, who, his brother spoke perfect English, so it's not clear why he didn't. <laughs> Let me put it this way. 
I never considered Kissinger a sex symbol. <laughs> but he encouraged that one bit of it, but there's no other sign that he was involved. He and Nixon had a very peculiar relationship. Uh, they were codependent, but also co-suspicious and co-egotistical, um, or anti-each other egotistical. So Nixon needed a lot of flattery. And when they took their first trip to, he took his first trip to Europe after he was president, uh, Kissinger was obliged to go to his room, to Nixon's room, and tell him how great he had been that day. Now, I believe, Nixon said, oh, I didn't need flattery, but I believe this because one of the more delicious uh, things on the tapes that were in that um, HBO uh, film not long ago, the day that Nixon fired Haldeman and Ehrlichman, and Dean, and this was going to end it, you know. Of course, it didn't. He called up Haldeman afterward, and he said, well, how do you think the speech went? <laughs> and he said, uh, Bob, you think it really was good? And Haldeman says, I think it was very effective, Mr. President. He just fired him. <laughs> and then he said, Bob, would you call around and see what the reaction to my speech has been? Haldeman, uh, with the greatest of self-control, I thought it was pretty cool, uh, said, well, Mr. President, I'm not sure I'm the right person to do that. <laughs> and then if you listen to that tape, you can hear the slurring of words, which was the sign. And he'd say, Nick says, I just love you. I love you like a son. I've always loved you. Gee, I hated to do that. I just love you and blah, blah, blah. So he did, so Kissinger played that role, but Nixon knew perfectly well that Kissinger would then go to the dread Georgetown and back up to Harvard and talk to his old buddies and badmouth Nixon, which he did. He was two-faced about him, and Nixon knew it. Nixon was not a dope. Uh, he, he, he knew these things. And so one time he thought, I'm going to get Henry. Um, Kissinger would ask the social secretary of the White House to seat him next to the most beautiful woman at the dinner. And that went on for a while, until Nixon found out. And he said, don't do that. Put him next to the ugliest woman. <laughs> this was a great triumph for Nixon. <laughs> they didn't trust each other. K Kissinger was not without his own ego situation. And so he kind of, and he was kind of um, emotional, I'll put it that way. And he sort of drove over the members of the staff crazy because he himself needed all this praise. And he wanted to be Secretary of State, and eventually he, he just wa kept walking over poor Bill Rogers, who'd been Nixon's old law partner and friend, Secretary of State. But Kissinger, in effect, took it over, and then uh, with Ford, it became official. For a while, he was both National Security Advisor and Secretary of State. This is a dangerous situation. You couldn't get other information before them. Uh, I told you that uh, Watergate was a constitutional crisis, and it was. And I realized when I went back and read that it also, I had more in there than I remembered, but I also come to think that it was an extraordinary, almost a putsch. Uh, the party in the White House took it upon themselves to decide and try to bring about who would be his opponent in 1972. And they systematically tried to mess up every other potential candidate. First, Ted Kennedy was tailed. And then he, Chappaquiddick happened, and Nixon knew he didn't have to worry about him anymore. But he, he was tailed by Ulazowicz. He would get, get the goods on him, find him in a compromising situation. Muskie, it is said that one of them wrote the Canuck letter that he was Maybe crying in the snow, much too much was made of that by my brethren. I mean, they just overdid it. Uh, but uh, there was this guy on the uh, committee staff, I believe, creep staff, named Donald Segretti, and he was known as the dirty jokester, the dirty trickster. So he would spoil political events by Democrats. He'd send in mice, white mice, he ordered in, you know, tens of dozens of pizzas. 
And this was funny? No. Uh, the break-in at the Watergate, um, Ed Muskie's chief of staff said that their files were rifled. Um, McGovern, they wanted to run against McGovern, figuring he was the weakest possible candidate. Now, I can't say that I can prove that they brought about McGovern's nomination, but for the party in power to decide and use its government instruments, again, to try to, to interfere with and try to arrange the opposition party's nominating process, I said with no misgivings in the book, this way lay fascism. Very scary stuff. First, I would like to thank you. At the time that this was all occurring, uh, my friends and I breathlessly <laughs> waited for your reports. Uh, the reports of Bernstein and Woodward, the television shows of Dick Cavett, which was the, basically the only thing on TV that talked about Watergate for a long time until Cronkite did his bit. You didn't watch Agronsky and Company? I'm hurt. Well, Agronsky, but... I know you, what you're saying. You had to be, you had to care about news to watch Agronsky. You didn't have to care about news to watch I Dick see. Cavett. That's a compliment, I think. At, <laughs> point taken. And without you and what you did, I'm not sure we would be, we would have gotten through it quite the same way we did. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Ms. Drew, I have, I have, I don't know if it's one question or if it's a question with two parts. Uh, we've had seven presidents since Richard Nixon. How would you compare them in terms of mental health and disassociativeness? <laughs> and as you mentioned in your remarks, we didn't have Fox and cable and the internet and Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in the early 70s. And that has changed the role of the press in terms of exposing what is going on. How would you talk about how the press functions now? Thank cool. you. No, nothing remotely like Nixon's very peculiar, uh, sui generis mentality. No, nothing, nothing remotely like that. Um, I hope we've learned to watch for certain traits. People have said, well, could Watergate happen again? And I, or they say, if Watergate happened again, would it work out the same way? Which is, first of all, you've got to examine the premise. It wouldn't happen again, not that way. Uh, no president would be given as long a leash uh, as Nixon was. Uh, the press, the press. There's no such thing as the press. There are a lot of different uh, outfits that uh, have different uh, methods of operating. There are lots of different reporters. There are uh, columnists who have very different points of view. Um, I did an essay in the, for the New York Review's website, nybooks.com about this concept of the Beltway, which is just silly. Everybody thinks alike. At the same time, it's crazy. It's a very lazy way of looking at what goes on here. Uh, so, yes, now there's more of a um, inclination to pounce. Everybody wants to be Woodward and Bernstein. And, um, that's good and it's not so good because you can jump to conclusions too quickly. They were very careful. And Ben Bradley was very careful. And he said, we're not printing anything unless you totally convince me that you can back it up. So otherwise, they'd have been ruined. Now, they were out on a limb. Now, this is about my movie career, all right? Uh, they were out on a limb on one thing. I happen to be doing my uh, half-hour interview programs for PBS. And I interviewed Richard Kleindienst, who was the Attorney General. And I always think the important thing about interviewing is to listen and make your questions short, to the point, no speeches. So uh, Kleindienst was going on and on about this being the biggest investigation. It was all still early. 
biggest investigation in the history of the universe, and we have you know this many thousand FBI things, and this many thousand this and that and the other. And I just said, well, did you know they were shredding documents at Creep? He said, no. And so Bob and Carl, I didn't know them then, but they got hold of the transcript, and they were so excited. And they, I actually went to New York. They called me. And we became friends after that. Uh, when Alan Pakula, and th it's in their book, All the President's Men, about this event. They went back to Bob's apartment, and they were watching the show, but they had already seen the transcript. And so when Alan Pakula, a great movie director who tragically died too soon, uh, was, and I didn't know him then, I did know him later, he uh, was making the movie, and I kept hearing that he was using that, he wanted to use that little excerpt in the movie. And, but it was so long, and he was chopping, chopping, but he refused to take that little segment out. So when they had the screening at the Kennedy Center and everybody was there, you could, I guess every, people's voices are distinctive, and so you sort of heard my flat Midwestern <laughs> voice coming on. <laughs> and then that happened, and everybody laughed. I am the only live person really in there. I mean, I didn't need a, Bo a Bob Redford to play me. <laughs> my hair was down to here. It was very soigné at the time, but people look at it now, and they call me up laughing. Uh, so, uh, but they had to be very, very careful. And I would say now, some people are more careful than others. And it's terribly important that there be X percent who are responsible and don't go with the flow and do their own independent work. And we have some of that. So you can't find any general view now of what is going on now. Um, I want some of the under, under, uh, 60. <laughs> Why, thank you. Yeah, my generation needs to pay attention to these issues because, hey, we're, we're voters. The book is for you. It's so that you can understand what happened then. And um, as I say, I hope you'll have one in your library. When you have kids, you can tell them about it. My first question is, has there ever been much discussion that... Richard Nixon, in, uh, during the uh, 68 election, he basically told the North Vietnamese, you know, don't I'll make a deal with uh, Johnson because I'll get you one better. And so, and Johnson was talking with Everett Dirksen, who was, uh, I think, the Senate leader at the time. And he said, you know, this is basically trees. And, but, you know, he, he from what I understand, Johnson covered up for Nixon. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. And... Any advice to an inspiring young journalist? Think again. <laughs> uh, I'll keep, now nah, stick with it. Well, yes. Uh, don't expect to get rich. Uh, expect to work with some really annoying editors. <laughs> uh, be prepared to work very hard. Uh, and it's actually a wonderful profession. It's like constant school, constant graduate school. You keep learning about issues. Uh, you meet interesting people. Uh, I can't imagine doing anything else. I fell into it. I had no plans to do it, but that's a whole other thing that I won't go into now. Um, just know that it's not going to come easily, and you're not going to be a star at the Washington Post or the New York Times next week. Uh, but work your way up. Be careful. Get it right. And also get context. I think one of the great missing things in so much journalism now is there's no context for anything. Um, kind of drives me crazy when I read some of the pieces about what happened on the Hill. I want to know more, well, why? Why did they block this? What, who's, who's blocking it? What's the issue? Sometimes that's there, sometimes it isn't. I think people really want to be informed. Well, there are enough people who really want to be informed. We need to respect that. And it's, it's a gift to be able to try to produce that. As I say, you keep learning. I remember learning about when I was at Congressional Court. It was my first job. I did, it, it was a job. I didn't think about it. And I learned about trade and creeping red fescue and things like that. 
Um, right now, I'm trying to sort out what really happened with arms to the rebels in Syria, and I'm talking to some people, and it's quite fascinating. So, you had a second, you had two questions, did you not? Uh, yeah, first one was the, the Oh, the, uh, Madame, Madame Chenault. Yes. Uh, it's pretty established that, um, Madame, that, uh, Nixon threw Madame Chenault, she was the widow of Claire Chenault, one of the great uh, bombers and Air Force heroes of the Second World War over China. And she was uh, his widow living at the Watergate. And they, uh, the Nixon people, through her, sent word to the North Vietnamese. No, I'm sorry, to the South Vietnamese. You said North, I'm saying South. Uh, it doesn't matter. The point's the same. Uh, don't the talks were going on in Paris. Now we're we're running up to the '68 election. It's very close. Uh, Humphrey was gaining on Nixon, and there's a school of thought. I kind of share it because I was watching it very closely. Had the election gone on another week, uh, Humphrey probably would have won. Nick uh, Nixon. Johnson was holding off and holding off on calling a bombing halt on North Vietnam. Humphrey was begging him to do it. Uh, Nixon liked, uh, Johnson liked to torture Humphrey, uh, but he finally did it, but it was a little close to the election. So there was no margin there. So the Nixon people through Madame Chenault told the South Vietnamese, do not agree to a peace agreement until I get in and I'll get a better deal for you. Now, Johnson knew this. The theory is that he didn't expose it because how did he know? <laughs> um, somebody's written a whole book about all this and said it's the beginning of Watergate. He's a very nice guy, but no, it wasn't the beginning of Watergate. It was off on its own. Now. What happened? Nixon got in, and he and Kissinger dragged out that war for another four or five years, and the deal they had got in the end was pretty much what they could have had at the beginning, but that's another story. Uh, yes, uh, I was a CIA analyst during Watergate, Who and I believe it was Director Colby who refused Nixon's request to intervene. Uh, I also thought Grancy and Company is the best news talk show ever. Uh, but, uh, my, my main avocation now is working to end marijuana prohibition. And of course, uh, Nixon is largely responsible. We had a national commission on marijuana. Nixon appointed nine of its members. The commission voted 13 to zero to decriminalize it. Nixon ignored the recommendation. And obviously, we are where we are today. I just wonder if you have any insight as to why he was such a zealot on marijuana when he liked alcohol so much. <laughs> and, but his. His comment about the Jewish psychiatrist was in reference to marijuana. He'd said to Haldeman, why are all the people out there supporting marijuana legalization Jewish? And he said, I guess it's because they're all psychiatrists. That was logical for him. <laughs> um, anyway, I mean, look at now. We're very torn about legalizing marijuana after all those years. You know, Nixon was from Whittier, California. He was a Quaker. Now, uh, he managed to break some of their rules, obviously. <laughs> but I could see that he would think the country's not ready for it. There is a whole thing, which I can't get into, but can sum up, of Nixon's um, moderation. He was, a, he was a slightly right of center Republican. He wouldn't get nominated, I mean, even if he were sane, he wouldn't get nominated by his party now. I don't know that Barry Goldwater would get nominated, but the party has moved so away from where uh, Nixon was. But a lot of these domestic achievements came about because he faced a strong Democratic Congress. And they kept sending these bills down there, and he had to, he negotiated some of them, he fought some of them, but he signed a bunch of them. Now, was he a great environmentalist? Well, he said to uh, Ehrlichman, you know, the environmentalists, that's crap for clowns. So I guess not. <laughs> Thank you so much.